Okay, so we have started recording. Uh, we'll give it maybe just like one minute just to make sure. People usually join. In, uh, I mean, I'm, Christine, you would know better than I would, but people tend to join these things late sometimes too. Yeah, they come in and go. Like some people come in a little later and then they'll leave and they'll come back and, you know, but. Yeah. I'm very familiar. Yeah, the <laughs> last one I was at was because we just started doing it at six. We were doing it at four for a while. Um, it went really well. Like a lot of people came. So. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to start. Um, so, okay. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Queens public libraries, literary Thursdays. Uh, my name is Mark Dendaro and this is. Christine, Christine Dejanski. Christine. Uh, we, we will be your hosts for this evening. Did you know there are no late fines on overdue materials at QPL? We want to make sure everyone can use the library's resources, no matter their circumstances. For more details on QPL's elimination of late fines, visit, visit queenslibrary.org slash goodbye late fines. School is in session and we have free help for homework. BrainFuse Help Now offers homework help, online tutoring, and more school support for kids in grades K through 12 daily from 2 to 11 p.m. A library card and Wi-Fi connection are all that your child needs in order to participate. Visit queenslibrary.org slash brainfuse to get started. The next election takes place on November 8th and early voting starts on October 29th. Visit our blog for more important dates, voting FAQs, voting plans, and voter resources. Now that we got that out of the way, I would like to introduce our special, our special guest for today, for today's Literary Thursday. Alejandro Varela, he, him, has published work in the Georgia Review, The Point Magazine, Boston Review, and Harper's, among other outlets. His graduate studies were in public health. Varela's first novel, The Town of Babylon, was, there we go, was released by Astra House in 2022, and correct me if I'm wrong, but as of Tuesday, is now a finalist for the National Book Award. Um, his second book, The People Who Report More Stress, is forthcoming in 2023, also from Astra House. Find him on Twitter at DRO Varela and Instagram at Alejandro Varela dot work. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. So um, I guess we can, might as well just uh, start with a little reading you had for us. Sure, let's do it. So I'm going to read from early in the book. Do you hear me fine? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to read from uh, the first chapter. Actually, I'm going to skip the first page because why not? And um, the only thing we need to know is that the main character is on his way to his high school reunion, his 20th high school reunion, and he has not seen anyone in 20 years. None of these people. Here we go. Over the last 20 years, these reunions had fleeted through my mind on occasion, the way I might envision a free fall or planes crashing into buildings, which is to say briefly and at times with a shudder. I feared in those moments the possibility of reviving the past, of slipping irretrievably into its grasp, lamenting, obsessing, something akin to speaking aloud a long-held secret on the verge of being forgotten, better left forgotten. In a matter of minutes, all of this will change. 20 years of abstention, of keeping the past where it belongs, will come to an end. To complicate matters, I hadn't packed anything appropriate to wear. Is there a standard attire for this sort of occasion? How does one dress for their past? More specifically, a past inside of a present-day Italian restaurant established in 1975 and since remodeled four times, once each by new owner. Italian, Italian-American, Puerto Rican, and most recently, an immigrant from Kerala. The communist state of India, Kerala, is arguably the healthiest and happiest region in the subcontinent, a state whose successes never seem to appear amid the popular images of Indian poverty, Indian elephants, Indian river bathing, and Indian yogis. I know very little about India, but if I hadn't just mentioned this about Kerala, I'd have been as remiss as everyone else. Joe's, the Italian restaurant, is six unformed, halfway harrowing blocks from my parents' home, the home of my youth. 
Six city blocks aren't much by way of distance. In the city, every block is a micro village worthy of recognition. Together, six blocks might constitute an entire neighborhood, possibly two, each with its own abiding culture. Here in the suburbs, however, the block is a nearly inconsequential unit of measurement. Here, all movement is coordinate based. The corner of Main and East Sixth, or behind the Friendlies, or you know, the old yellow house with the POW flag. Distance is also measured in time 12 minutes door to door, 25 minutes without traffic, or I did it in under an hour because there were no cops. And there is no minimum distance for traveling by car. No one walks anywhere at any time, especially if the stretch of land in question is a six lane commercial corridor flanked by incomplete sidewalks and a coarse layer of crushed gravel whose low wild west plumes of gray dust materialize at each step. The people in the car zooming past me, if they've taken notice, assume I'm poor, homeless, high, or here illegally, and likely all of the above. If they've given me a closer look, fitted dark green slacks, summery white linen long sleeve button down shirt open somewhat seductively mid sternum, brown skin, they might be confused. They might be telling themselves I'm lost or stranded. In their defense, I am the sole person standing on this narrow ledge of pseudo sidewalk, which ends in about 50 feet. From here, I move on to a borderless tract of wispy grass that appears to have sprouted from the surrounding dirt or from one of the muddy micro lagoons that licks its edges, like hair on a pubescent chin or on a dome of advanced age, the alpha or the omega. These anomalous moments of nature are proof that there was once another landscape tucked beneath this capitalist afterthought. It's almost 8 p.m. and there's a slow drip from my armpits. If I back out now, no one will be the wiser. I didn't RSVP. I require only a modicum of temerity and a plan. The route home is simple. Turn around, circumnavigate the, the archipelago of sidewalk islands, cut through one football field sized parking lot, then camp out at the Applebee's until my parents have gone to bed. Or I could head straight home now, admit defeat, and sit in front of the television set with my father, who's probably going to die soon. Not today, but sooner than later. A small fissure in the traffic continuum opens up. I won't have to sprint, but neither can I cross the six lanes at my leisure. There's no median. The friable pavement is pocked with faint atavistic yellow, yellows and whites that suggest it hasn't been painted in years. Lanes barely delineated one from the other, enticing everyone to swerve by omission. I scurry across like a tense squirrel, lacking the blitheness of my youth when I was one of a small gang who'd bisect these lanes on low end 10 speeds, mindlessly returning with sharp words and empty threats, the vitriol of the horns and hostilities speeding past. I'm here. The restaurant parking lot, an open air grid of 10 by 10 is halfway filled with gargantuan metal boxes, all of them recently washed and buffed, catching the twilight in their veneers. In this town, one's face to the world is their vehicle. A sleek ride can effectively belie or at the very least undercut perceived inadequacies. It can make a shitty life interstitially magnificent. It's been this way since I can remember. Rims, tinted glass, and speaker systems were the reasons were the reason my friends had jobs in high school. A few traded respectable Jesuit universities far from here for used sports cars, bribes from their parents in order to avoid private and out-of-state tuitions. For a high school reunion, a car wash is as essential as a new outfit, a haircut, or, or weight loss. The restaurant, nondescript and industrial in appearance, abuts a paintball arcade, which is next door to a pool supply store, which shares a lot with a window siding manufacturer, which is across a narrow side street from a tile company, all of them empty and slatted in the same eggshell colored vinyl. At the end of this bland chain of businesses is the red marquee Uncle Billy's. The electronic store where we'd buy our TVs, VCRs, CD players, refrigerators, microwaves, and washing machines, and where my brother worked as a stock boy in high school, and then as a salesman. It's where he died. If I dawdle long enough, Joe's outside Joe's long enough, someone will walk past and recognize me, and I'll be forced to go inside. I may do just that, wait until I have no choice. This indecisiveness would have amused my brother. Don't be such a chicken shit, he might have said. He switched from fag to chicken shit after I told him I was gay. This was typical of Henry. When I least expected it, he was a good big brother. 
In fact, when I told him I was worried about coming out to our parents, he came out to them instead to test the waters a couple of years before I came out to them. After a week, Henry told him he'd been kidding. Mom was pissed, but dad thought it was funny, he later explained. My brother was the kind of person who could never muster the courage to ask for a raise or a promotion, who quit several jobs by simply not showing up, who never, ra who never raised his hand in class, who refused to give simple explanations that would have that would have otherwise extricated him from complicated situations and who rarely defended himself when it mattered most. But he had no problem attending his high school reunion. He didn't stay in touch with many of the friends he'd had back then, but he longed for those years anyway. At some point after high school, which by all measures he detested during the actual living of it, nostalgia became his default emotional state. Until the day he died, he referred to that era sincerely as the good old days as if his remembrances were palliative. My theory? The misery of his adulthood was an order of magnitude greater than the misery of his youth, and over time, less miserable somehow transformed into good old times. In fact, it rankled my brother that I didn't recall our youth more fondly, as if my memories risked contaminating or in some way invalidating his. The problem is you think you're better than everyone, he said the month before his heart attack. He'd said it to me dozens of times before, but this time he was matter of fact about it and he punctuated it with, and you probably are. Better isn't a fair or apt description of how I view myself. I don't think I'm intrinsically better or more important than anyone else, but I admit that I, admit that I consider myself something. Correct, maybe. After all, I did the things we were supposed to do. I did my homework, I got good grades, I seldom disobeyed my parents, I applied to college, I got into college, I went to graduate school, I got a job teaching at a university, I put down 25% on my small apartment, I don't own a car. I buy my produce at the farmer's market. I speak three languages well and a few others so-so. I support a nationalized health service, alternatives to incarceration, and a tripling of the minimum wage. I use LED bulbs. I don't cheat. I avoid high fructose corn syrup, and I keep plastics out of the dishwasher and refrigerator. I turn the water off while I lather my hands. I consume media created almost exclusively by, another, by anyone other than cisgender, able-bodied white men. I apologize when I'm wrong, and I try to do better. I vote for the Green Party in the primary and the Democrat in the general election. I wait for my husband to orgasm before I do. I don't, however, consider myself unique or better. I'm doing the bare minimum, and the bare minimum should have been enough, collectively speaking. It was meant to add up. Instead, here we are in a gas-guzzling wasteland bereft of sidewalks, but with a surfeit of old sports cars on cinder blocks tucked beneath blue tarps. I might be wrong about all of it. I often get worked up about these things and later realize that I haven't left sufficient room for the fullness of humanity or for the consequences of history. It's my way. But I'm not always wrong. The sound of tires inching over gravel perforates the silence. Another steel behemoth rolls into the lot, and I realize that escaping will be more complicated from this moment onward. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, that hearing that now having read almost the entire book it it really drove home what a great introduction to the character of, of andres that is um that is really that is really a, a great summary of you know how sort of where he's at um at that moment wow now i now i kind of want to read the book a second time <laughs> um because now Oops. i feel like i'm gonna i'm gonna catch so many other things um okay so i guess um we just lost christine uh so i guess we're gonna start with um some questions and I... oh. you okay yeah i'm good i'm okay. having technical difficulty right now okay so um would you like me i can just start with the first question then um, um sure Okay, so um, okay, so I guess we'll just start with some 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 questions. Uh, yes. So, um, so the first question, pretty pretty obvious. Um, what was the development and writing of this book like, and how naturally did the story and the characters develop for you in your your process of writing the book? Um. So, the book was rather kind of unromantically uh, forced a little bit. I had written a short story collection 
and I was having a very difficult time selling it because the <laughs> publishing industry initially is uh, resistant to, they, they claim they don't sell well. And that, that, that is probably true. They don't sell as well as novels. And I was an unknown writer without many connections in the industry. My background is in public health. And so I, uh, my agent tried for a couple of years to sell the book and, and couldn't, and we got people who kept saying, oh, it's great. We love it. Could you make it a novel or do you have a novel to write instead? And after two years of rejections, I said, you know what, I'm just going to write a novel and maybe the short story collection will sell another time. And so I sat down to write the novel and I wrote it rather quickly based on an idea that I'd had that had been on my mind for a story. And, um, so that idea had sort of been circling. It was based on a, a town called Rosetto, Pennsylvania. Um, are, are you familiar with Rosetto? It's a small town about 75 miles west of New York City. In brief, it was settled by Italian immigrants in the 1870s uh, who faced a tremendous amount of discrimination from the sort of more powerful English and Welsh who had been here already at least a few generations. And they hunkered down and built this town and uh, a structure there that um, that left them better off, which is to say that by the 1950s, the town, the townspeople of Rosetto had inexplicably better health than the rest of the country and all of its neighboring towns. And so a bunch of researchers descended on the town and what they discovered was that it was such a tight knit community in part because of a shared experience, not just their trajectory into the country, but also their shared enemy, you know, the, the people who had been discriminating against them. And uh, all of the houses had three and four generations of Rosettans, and they had half the rate of heart disease, which is the biggest killer in the U.S. then as it is now. Their life expectancy was higher. There was no crime. And people suspected it was probably diet. So when the researchers got there, what they found was that they, uh, that lard was a tremendous part of their diet. It was in almost all their meals. They smoked unfiltered cigars. They drank more wine than the average American. They were more overweight than the average American. So all of the things that should have made them less healthy, um, well, they didn't. it didn't make them more healthy, but it didn't necessarily uh, decrease their health um, in, in an extreme way. And they just realized after interviewing everyone that they had a greater sense of safety and, and community than the average American. They were just talking about a population of people who felt uh, protected and cared for and um, didn't live with stress. So they may be stressed at work, but when they got back to their community, they felt completely safe. Anyway, I wanted to write about that experience. Yeah, and that's what I wrote about. It's interesting you talk about the town because um, we were talking earlier and both agreed, um, Mark and I, that there's so much in the book that kind of, it, it's, 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 without saying it, it reminds us of New York, like Long Island, uh, the town of Babylon itself, the town of Long Island. So we're just like wondering, curious. Like, did you consider New York in your writing? Like, like as you were writing it at all? Yes. So Rosetto was the inspiration, but mm -hmm. I grew up in a in a hamlet, an unincorporated village on Long Island on the South Shore called Deer Park, oh, yeah. and Deer Park is within is within the town of Babylon, and. I would never have said as a kid that I grew up in Babylon. I would just see the town of Babylon signs as we entered and as we left, but, mm. but it never occurred. So, because you know, if you're from Long Island, you don't define yourself by the township. You define yourself by the small sort of village or, or, or micro sort of village that you live in. And so, uh, yeah, so I grew up in Deer Park. So when I was writing this book, I was thinking, well, I didn't grow up in a healthy community that reminded me of Rosetto. I feel like I grew up in Rosetto after the younger generations left, which is what happened to Rosetto. 20 years mm -hmm. after those researchers were there, all the younger generations were like, I want to get out of here. I need, I don't, I can't live in this place. Everyone's in my business. And they left. Mm -hmm. They left because they wanted shinier things and more space and to live in a city. And then guess what? The health of the town decreased. It yeah. was no longer as protected and safe. So I imagined that Deer Park at some point might have been something like a Rosetto. And so then when I was writing it, I went back home to visit my folks who are still there. And I, and I paid more attention, you know, I took pictures. Yeah. I looked around, I stared at like the businesses. I made note of how few sidewalks there were, which is always a phenomenon, you know, that I grew up with, you know, I was aware of it, you know, you didn't walk anywhere in where yeah. we grew up. Um, 
And so very much influenced the imagery because I've never been to Rosetto. So I know mm. it's sort of sociological and public health history, but I don't know it personally, but I did know Long Island. So then I took those ideas and put them together. Well, um, and the note of you growing up in the, the book, the character is so coming of age out in what could be Long Island. Um, what I also thought was interesting was, you know, I'm about, I'm actually the same age as the protagonist character. I'm 43. We graduated in, well, 98, but still. Um, yeah, to me, it felt like it was watching an episode of The Wonder Years, like all this relevance to Pearl Jam, um, Pearl Jam and, uh, you know, the late 90s and growing up, you know, like in kind of like at the turn of the millennium. So um, what was your inspiration about writing about that era? Well, I too, I, we share a similar era, Christine, you and I, I'm, you know, I was class of 97, like my protagonist. I have never been to a high school reunion and I don't keep in touch with my high school friends, but which actually was very appealing to me as subject matter because I, the more I explored what I didn't know, the more I could, you know, sort of continue to claim it was fiction, right? It is fiction because I don't know any of these things to be true about these characters, but I imagine them. Mm -hmm. And so I was very much in that era. In fact, when I was writing the book, I made a playlist of about 150 songs. Mm -hmm. And I listened to those 150 songs for the 13 weeks that I was writing. I just listened oh, to wow. them over and over and over and over again. And um, in fact, a, for a lot of the lyrics ended up in the first pass of the book. And just before we went to print, my publisher reached out and said, listen, the lawyer read it. And they said, you have to get rid of all the lyrics. Oh. So there were about 11 scenes that I had to touch up in one or two and yeah. rewrite, which is, this is very kind of wow. a stressful last, last minute situation. But, yeah. but, uh, but the point was that part to me, for me, part of the suburban experience is being in a car. And when you're in a car, you're listening to the radio and there isn't that much variety. And so you're listening essentially to top 40, the same 15 to 20 songs, you know, within two hours, you could hear the same song three times in the same station, you know? And yeah. so um, that idea, that repetition and, and that, I, that mindset, I wanted to recre recreate that too. So that's why I was listening to it over and over. And that's why I in injected it into the story. Did you ever make the playlist like um, like publicly available or like like reveal what the playlist was? Um, a part of the playlist, I about twenty something songs are on my the publisher's website. You can link to it from there. My edit, my editor made a a, a brief playlist, and then Large Hearted Boy, which is a, a website that um, asks it's asks new authors to or just new writers of, 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 de of recent books to share playlists and the inspiration of the music. So on their website, I annotated the playlist so that every song has an explanation for why it ended up in the book. So it's really, that's a playlist of just the songs that ended up in the book, either re by reference that were referenced. And, uh, but no, the, my, the 150 songs, those are just on, on my phone <laughs> or my computer. Um, that's, that's great. Yeah. And, and. <laughs> Going back to the um, the inspiration behind um, like how it's based off of Long Island, I I was also born and raised on Long Island. I still live out there, and it's 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 very uncanny. Like it's even even in the reading you just did, like when you were describing that like that like business plaza where the restaurant is, I'm like I've been there. Like we there is every other like Italian restaurant on Long Island is in that exact place you just described. <laughs> it's 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 really incredible. Um and I have a question sort of related to that. So um so one of the things that I personally enjoyed and related to the most was sort of what I'm calling what I call like I guess I don't know if this is the right way of describing it given the whole context of the book, but the sense of like hometown dread almost where you're like coming back to where you grew up and you're kind of you feel like maybe you don't relate to everyone who was there as you as you used to um why and this can be from your personal experience or just from the experience of of the characters you've written but why do you think some of us return when we know we don't 
fit in or when we know it's going to be like a rough transition going back home? Why do we go back to uh, where we grew up or what what drives a person to do that, in your opinion? Right. Um, I suspect there are a number of reasons. What One of the more obvious and practical ones could be financial, you know. Maybe where you grew up is is sort of where you have ties and a room to stay in when when things are rough elsewhere. Uh, uh, for me, when I go home, it's it's to see my parents, so they're still there, and and there's I will always return to that town where I grew up because, as long as my parents are there. I don't suspect I will ever return after they're no longer there, and so that's in part I think. While I was writing this book and, and I explored it a bit in the later chapters, because these thoughts have crossed my mind too, there's a sense that when you live somewhere, for example, I live in New York City, but I, I was born in Jackson Heights and I have family there too, still, and I feel very much a connection to Jackson Heights and I have lived in the same neighborhood in, in on the same street in Brooklyn for almost 21 years. So I have obviously roots here as well. but. Um, but when I'm back home, there's still a sense of, I was here first, you know, like I was here a long time ago. And so there is, if, if I was going to have some power in this world, you know, because we live in such, in such a, I don't know what it is. I wanted to say almost, we claim ownership over, over the spaces that we, we live in as if, you know, I have a right to have it. So defensively, one can get into that mindset too. Like I know my parents still live in, in a mostly white community. Mm -hmm. And uh, historically, I don't, I, I think we didn't, we didn't have the friendliest ex neighbors and experiences. You know, we were the sort of odd family out. And, um, and sometimes I do sort of preemptively arm myself with that sort of mentality, which is appears in the book. If, if, that sort of way of thinking that's like, you know, I can claim ownership here too, in a way that I don't always feel in a community that I've gentrified in Brooklyn, right? Or in the, the Jackson Heights that I left as a kid that I can tell you which are my favorite restaurants and the playgrounds that I like, but I didn't go to school there, you know, I didn't, I don't know it as intimately as the people who have been there for the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. Anyway, so I think some of that, it's, it's never a reason I go back home, but when I'm there, I, I draw a little bit of strength, maybe, or stability from reminding myself that I know this culture. I know this place. Um, yeah. Um, Christine, did you want to, did you have a question? Or do you uh, want me to just go to the next one? Uh, um, not really relevant to that, but maybe you have a question that's relevant to that. Well, uh. Yeah, I mean, I have I have questions galore. I just want to make sure I'm not like I'm just not no, going no, over no, you. No, 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 no. Um, okay, so um, sort of jumping off of that, um, this book. One thing I was I was sort of not really expecting with this book is just how many different um, important topics are like just seamlessly integrated into this what it, what starts off as a very simple story of going to a high school reunion you know the book tackles childhood trauma fear of failure self-acceptance um mental illness it, it dedicates a lot of its uh uh text to the immigrant experience and how that has sort of colors people's experiences in this country um was it your I, I, I know you mentioned like sort of how it came to be written as a novel, but when you were writing it as a novel or as the short story that it eventually be that it eventually became the novel, was it your goal to sort of specifically write about these topics or did they just develop organically? Um, I mean, so many of those topics are near to me in my own experience. So, you know, in some way I feel capable of of exploring them um, and another part is that writing for me is i still consider myself a public health worker it's what i was trained to do it's what i went to graduate school for and my medium for it right now is is fiction writing 
and uh, I have spent most of the last mm, almost 10 years trying to find a way to talk about the topics and the issues that are important to me that I think society should be dealing with or that are the most pressing in terms of a kind of a public population health and trying to find ways to, you know, explore them through narrative and make them appealing, entertaining, funny, captivating. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm doing. And it's, it's, it's a fine line because you don't, you, you don't, you risk being dogmatic and turning people off. Well, that's one thing I really noticed. I'm sorry. You're so, no, sorry. no, no, please, please. Oh, okay. So I just, I also noticed how in the, the novel itself, you switch narration from first to third person. And mm. uh, like, you know, I thought that was really cool. You know, you, you went from talking about, you know, having the protagonist narrate and then, you know, there's like this third person, like kind of narrating the whole scene, like observing what Henry's saying, what Andre is saying. So what, um, what, what was your inspiration for doing that? A choice of I, writing. Right. I knew that there are two answers to this. I knew that Andres, the narrator was going to approach being insufferable because he has a lot to say. And I wanted that to be his quirk, you know, maybe sort of a more cheerful, more optimistic, but a, a more honest and mature. Holden Caulfield, but not really Holden Caulfield, but you know, that sort of idea of someone, you know, that has a lot, yeah. a, a lot of gripes with society and is sharing them in real time with us through his, in his interiority. Right. And, but then there's a whole history of the town and the people that he's encountering that he couldn't possibly know. Mm -hmm. And the only way to explore that for me was to bring in an omniscient narrator. Now he could know them to be fair. He could know them. Right. But if he did, I thought he, he would cross the line from being charmingly insufferable to just being like, this is a full on sociological lesson <laughs> and we're not really, you know, we're not, yeah. we're not allowing for, for things. To... It's nice that he doesn't know everything. I think it creates a bit of sort of dramatic irony for him. Uh, he being kind of, uh, yeah, but, uh, hmm, sorry, I lost my train of thought there, but I, also was inspired by the books that I read right before. Before I sat down to write the novel, I was a bit cowed by the idea of switching from short story to novel. I, I really was concerned with being able to write something so long. And so I gave myself some homework and I read, I think 10 novels in about two weeks or three weeks, oh. I read them as quickly as possible. And, try to absorb and get in that mindset. And the three that stood out to me the most were uh, The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, In the Time of Butterflies by Julia Alvarez, and The Bluest Eye by um, Toni Morrison. And all three of those books played with narrators and with time. And it really kind of inspired me, but also made me feel, you know, safe enough to to do the same. Yeah. That's I I really I really like that. One of the things um sort of related to the the narrative shift that Christina and I were actually talking about before we started this is that like some of our favorite chapters were the almost like supplementary chapters that kind of interrupted the main narrative where we just took go over like the entire history of um some of the the characters that were kind of not side characters, but they weren't the focus. And we just learned their almost their entire backstory in the course of one or two chapters. And that really, we really liked that because it, it gave this, it created a lore for this town that we're only seeing through the main character's eyes in the aftermath of when the town was last relevant to him. And the shift in narrative and the, and the additional supplementary chapters were really, I, they, they really make you take a step back and be like, wait a minute, there's more to these characters than, than we thought. And it, it, we, we, we were, that was, those were some of my favorite chapters when we learned about Paul and Simone and, and where they came from and how they wound up exactly where they are when, when uh, Andres meets them. Uh, Again, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I, 
that has everything to me for me to do with how I view public health practice and the importance of I mean, so much of public health is about getting people to change their behaviors, wear a condom, put on a seatbelt, quit smoking, stop eating salty food. It's always like prescriptive stuff that doesn't fully take into account the systems that make you do those things and the conditions that kind of put back you into a corner and that, and that dictate the, your health behaviors. And so I thought it was like with most things, I, I think it's important to explore why, what people's motivations are. What are their histories? Why are they who they are? And again, I will say Toni Morrison really stands out to me as if there was ever going to be a genre called public health fiction, uh, Toni Morrison is one of those people. I, I, th I think in multiple books, but I'm thinking specifically the bluest eye, you have these at least one, but often several dastardly characters who you think are completely irredeemable. And then you turn to the next chapter and she jumps back in time and tells us who this person was and how they came to be. And then you think, oh, he is who he is because we made him that way. Collectively as a society, we made them. We made them who they are. And I believe that. And that the most effective public health work or social work takes into account people's histories. Otherwise, it's there's no transformation. And so that's that's why those chapters are how they are. Okay. Um, Christine, do you have one? Or do again? I I don't want to like I don't want to like because I really I really like I really like this book. So I'm like. <laughs> Oh, like really so like, uh, yeah. How, um, I, this other question I have is, um, like you went from writing like journalism stuff and short stories, like how, um, and you didn't in many ways answer this question, but just like, how did you like, like, do you like writing fiction novels better than writing journalist stories, like journalism or like how, how was that transition for you? So prior to writing. My, my only experience that I had in, in published writing before fiction was a couple of op-eds, mm -hmm. public health related, and research articles about cancer that mm -hmm. I published because of studies that I was working on. Yeah. Um, that sort of advocacy type writing or science writing, you know, there isn't much artifice. You, you get to be as direct as you want. In fact, you have to be direct very economical, very fact-based, and um, the, I, I found fiction more difficult because I really needed to create. There's a lot of creation mm -hmm. involved, and you have to create and ultimately, for me anyway, accomplish the same thing I'm doing with the op-ed or with the science article, which is like communicate something very important to the reader something that I feel passionate about or that I think we should all feel passionate about, but do it in a way that's, well, it's just, it's a pleasure to be there. You know, I really, I, it makes me feel oh. good to think that people are reading the book, thinking maybe briefly about reparations for the descendants of slavery or for all black people is which the argument that, that I think um, Andres makes. And, but enjoying it. And maybe there's humor in that scene um, so that, yeah, that to me is, is maybe the bigger difference. I do find it difficult. That said, I have been thinking that I want to work next on a collection of essays or soon on a collection of essays. And I'm daunted by that task because I'm in full on fiction brain mode. So now how do I go back? And, and Did, the essay is a different, is a different form anyway. Because like, and then it's interesting you say that because the artist side of the brain, I always get the left and right confused, but there's one side of the brain that's more artistic and one is more scientific and it's just, it's um, really interesting how you're able to do both. Like, you know, some people, you know, they're more scientists or like myself, I'm more artsy, but um, so, but did you know when you were like in the stress of yours, like doing scientific writing and that you would someday do fiction? Like, did you ever like, did you have it like a craving? Like, oh, I really want to write this as a fiction piece. Like someday, like 10, 15 years ago. Did you think that you would? If you ask my mother, she's, she'll say that from a little, since the time I was a little kid, I was writing plays and, and, and screenplays and, you know, jotting down ideas. I had always wanted to write film and I didn't mm -hmm. do a thing about it. I didn't do a thing about it, yeah. but I knew I wanted to, and I had these ideas and one day I would sit down and commit to it. And a friend of mine who's a director 
he once we were just walking down the street and he said, can you tell me about the screenplay you want to write? And I said, yeah, well, no, no. He said, tell me the first scene, what happens? Mm -hmm. and I was walking down the street and I told it to him and he said, now go home and write it down. Yeah. And, I did. and it came out as a short story because I didn't know the format for a screenplay. And mm -hmm. that short story got published after it was rejected a number of times it was published. Yeah. And that's the sort of the route that I took. So yes, when I was doing s more scientific writing or more op-ed, I was always concerned with it being a beautiful sentence. That was important mm -hmm. to me. And did it, does it evoke some sort of image? Does it make you feel? That was always very important to me. Yeah. And, and then, but when I'm writing fiction, I'm always thinking, is this going to make a difference? Is this going mm. to change someone's mind about something? Is it going to inform them? Are they going to feel like they walked away with something interesting that they can share with someone else? So both are happening at once. Yeah. Do you, you ever think, uh, cause you, you meant, you mentioned screenplays and, and nowadays with all the like streaming and adaptations, it does kind of, it, it, the question inevitably becomes, especially when the book is very well loved, would you ever see this work being adapted in any way? I, even it, it, either as. Uh, something on the screen or even maybe on the stage? Could you ever envision that happening or did you ever think of it that way? I didn't think about it that way as I was writing it, but I have thought about it significantly since, you know, I would, I would very much love to see this adapted, whether as a, you know, a, a series or, or a movie, I don't know, because I can't, I could be convinced either would work. And we're also living in this time of, of, you know, sort of peak television where the series give you, gives the creators more room to flesh out characters. And um, so I'm open to either. I would love that. And in fact, I have a TV agent, I think, or a film and TV agent who is shopping it around. Um, I don't know how likely it is that it'll happen. I will say that the National Book Award nomination has made many things possible that didn't seem possible a week ago. And uh, so I'm going to keep my fingers crossed because I think the fact that I was and have been all my life such a film buff and been, I was, I watched a lot more TV and film as a kid than, as, than I read. Reading is something I mostly started to do in my 30s so that I could educate myself on how to write. And, um, but my brain, and I think the book shows that it's very visual. There's a lot of dialogue. There's, I think I've been, I'm more influenced by, you know, Spike Lee than I am by Ernest Hemingway for sure. That would be, that would be really great. <laughs> yeah. I um, saw Spike Lee in the park a few days ago and I, oh. tempt, I was tempted to run home and grab my book and, and, and just run over to him and say, Mr. Lee, here, consider this. And I had the, I asked uh, the publisher the head of the publisher where I work, if she could send a copy of my book to Pedro Almodovar, the Spanish filmmaker. Yeah. yeah, I'm a huge fan of his work and he had been connected in some way to our publishing house. And so, but that was months ago and I've not heard anything from Pedro. So who knows if that'll happen. You never know. You never know. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so, da, 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 da. okay. So, um, one of the uh, questions I have was that uh, Andres has to face a lot of uh, demons coming home for for this reunion. Um, demons relating to a lot of things that a lot of readers might not ever want to think about or face about themselves if they can help it. Um, as the person who invented the character, um, what do you think? Do you think that the journey back home is worth it or not worth it for him? And why do you think that? Um, certainly, it's worth it for him because of his relationship with his family, and he is essential there. You know, uh, he's the only child left, and Rosario needs him to take care of Alvaro, the father. I think there was some growth there. Clearly he's going through a rough time in his marriage. And 
being able to connect with someone and to find the relationship with Jeremy in a lot of ways is, is quite healing. To be able to revisit something, to have questions answered, his connection with, with um, connection or reconnection with Paul. I mean, it doesn't, it's not particularly fruitful, but again, there's closure there for him. And most importantly with Henry and Simone, I think he's able to make his peace with Henry and how, you know, maybe guilt that he felt and with Simone to be able to establish or reestablish a relationship. I think it's great. And I don't think it sends, I was worried it would send some sort of message that you must return and become an essential part of a community that you don't feel safe or comfortable in. Mm -hmm. And I don't think so. I think my hope is that you can, that this, what this says is, or, or what we can do as humans is pick and choose and, and have bonds with the people and the, the parts of, of our communities that we want to. I, so, yeah. Great. I actually, um, sort of relating to, um, what you said about feeling that it was going to send the wrong message. I had a, a question, which was like, I don't know how much you've read or, or seen as far as the reception of your book, but. Have you seen any interpretations of the book or uh, of, well, have you seen any interpretations of the book that people were taking away from it that you thought were just completely wrong? Like, I know, I know we try to be open ended about like how people perceive art, but did you ever read someone's take on your book and just be like, that is not even remotely what I, what I'm trying to do here? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I, I saw, for example, someone can't remember it's a it was a very small journal they reviewed the book and they said some the head the tagline was if you're not white it's not good to be in the suburbs or something like that or it's not safe and i thought it's tough oh it's tough it's tough being not not being white in the hot suburbs was like the tagline or something and I, you know sometimes you don't choose your own headline i wouldn't blame the writer but it's what I really wanted to communicate in this is, yes, if you are isolated from the whole, from the community at, at large, and you feel alone, that has a very real effect on your body, the wear and tear vis-a-vis -vis cortisol and adrenaline and just all sorts of stuff. But that effect may, may be worse on the isolated person, but it's not good on the, the entire community. It's not. And we saw that in Rosetto, and we see it there. So I feel like if you walk away from this book and you think, gosh, all the people of color in this have it really rough and the white people are doing all right. Then I don't think you're seeing how whenever someone is suffering in your community, it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. It affects everyone. There's there's a lot of energy that goes into being ignorant and hating. There's a lot of energy that goes into, um, you know, sort of fooling yourself and and using scapegoats. That, that there's, there's a kind of a, a personal and intellectual dishonesty that wears on you, you know? If I for a moment think I'm wrong about something and I don't feel great about that, to, to then put in all this effort to convince myself that I'm right, knowing that I'm wrong, or or to pretend not to investigate why I feel a certain way, that, that also has an effect on who you are. And so, yeah, so the people who were trying to maybe see it that way, I had a lot of folks, and I knew this was gonna happen, a lot of folks, just comments here and there, they weren't reviews so much, feel kind of like, oh, I feel like I was just preached to and I was told what to do and this person hates why this person hates white people or hates, and I just thought, I don't, that couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, that's not what I was trying to communicate at all. I think sometimes people don't like to feel that who they are and what they believe um, or where they're from could be imperfect and and so and they wear that you know i have like these <laughs> long reviews on these websites where people are really upset and they feel like they've been tricked or misled or or attacked by my book and i think wow thank you <laughs> i think <laughs> it really affected you <laughs> and i'm grateful I, I mean i don't want anyone to suffer because they read this book but anyway Uh, well, um, <clears throat> what that was interesting is on that note was how, um, 
to build on it was like how everybody, the character, the characters in the book, everybody had their thing. Like nobody was perfect. I think that everybody was painted a very real picture. Like especially the scene with you know, spoiler with uh, Jeremy, the friend Jeremy, who they um, you know, he's like, oh, his parents, he says, his maid, he's never, you know, his parents are never home. We do whatever we want. And it turns out, you know, there's his parents were very against their their relationship and it's just you know it's, it makes you really kind of see you know it looks like it's one way but no it's really not perfect you know it's got issues just like everybody else has yeah yeah i mean and which is true to life right mm -hmm. just true to life yeah so let me see oh my god it's already 650. <laughs> Um, did you, did you have another question, Christine, or did you want me to? Um, what, oh, so can you tell us about a little, like, sneak peek what to expect in the next book that you have coming out next year? So the next book is called The People Who Report More Stress. It's a collection of short stories, m m several of which were in the original bundle that I was trying to sell years ago, but most not because in the meantime, I've written many more stories. So yeah. They are, there are 13 stories and, uh, if Babylon is about not being able to go home or the difficulties of going home, this is about how difficult it is where you land, which is to say, my characters are always class jumpers. I have that in common with them. I was raised working class below, you know, working class in a time when you, it wasn't, you could, you, you wasn't necessarily poverty. Although maybe technically it was based on the poverty calculator, but, um, and now I, I don't worry day to day about survival. You know, yeah. my life has gotten much easier and that came with education. It came with who I married, which is capitalism's back door that no one likes to talk about. And I, I wanted to explore that when you leave someplace. Um, and then land somewhere else, you're never fully at ease in either. If you're someone like me <laughs> in the TMI, if you are someone like me who's thinking often about the intricacies of human relationships and who we are and where we're going as individuals, but as a society, then it's tough. It's tough. And so Andres goes back and he's like, I'm a different human. How can I be here? Eduardo, who is the main protagonist in the collection, is is now in a gentrified part of New York City and living this middle and upper middle class life. And he's not comfortable there either, but the issues are all different. Yeah. And so expect that, expect a kind of a, you know, it's a bit of a, yeah, change there. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And this was really, it was really a great book. We both really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. And I look forward to your next book. Thank you. And I'm really grateful for these very thoughtful questions. Thank you very much. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you think they're thoughtful. <laughs> um, I had one more. I think we have time for. We have time for one more. So, um. I think, well, let me, let me, let me ask like a, like a pre preface question. So I'm not like missing the mark here um in in the book andres talks a lot about i don't know if i'd say a lot about but he he does talk about um like the impact of like um colonialism and imperialism and that mindset and how it's mm -hmm. sort of made an impact on um the country and on like the general the general mindset um so but I guess my preface question, just to make sure I'm not missing the mark, is like is it's is it safe to say that it that is a theme that you that you think about like as an author, or was that meant to be like I don't know if that's a, a theme that you want people to talk about or if you think is a, you know intentional. Is that something that you you were consciously doing in the in the in the book? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Because I had a question about that, and then when you mentioned, uh, when I asked you the question about getting an interpret uh, something about the book completely misinterpreted, I was like, let me make sure I'm not one of those people. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is a just sort of a a general question. Jumping off of that, um, we see a lot of people 
when they're faced with issues of like how those ideologies and those events impacted the country and impacted the people in this country, um, a lot of people will say, well, that was a really long time ago, or I didn't personally do those things, so it's not a big deal to me. I, um, because they, they become very, I guess, defensive of their privilege, or they want to be seen as maybe being completely neutral on, on the issue, even if they, they can't be. So as someone who's written about the topic and, and has, has made that, um, a, a topic in, in your book, do you have any insight on how to sort of use your voice or how any of us can use our voice to sort of reach out and make people understand that like, these are systemic issues that these are that these are things that go beyond like a story or uh, a history book and very much impact real life the way we see it in in the book yeah that's a great question you know i think in popular culture in hollywood even just in our own lives we put a lot of emphasis because we work we we trade, so to speak, in individuals, not in systems, right? I'm not interact when I interact with a human in the subway, I'm not thinking, well, I am, but <laughs> most of us are thinking about the systems that brought us here. We're thinking about you stepped on my foot. You're a human. You stepped on my human foot and I'm gonna fight with you about it. Mm -hmm. And why are you so stressed? And why, you know, why is this thing so packed? And why isn't the train working? And so these are all systems that then kind of sort of come together that then lead to these tense situations. Um, I think we need to stop thinking so much about the interpersonal. It makes us feel good to see a movie where a poor person and a rich person find common ground, but that is wasted energy. I think what we need to be thinking about is how do we collapse all of these hierarchies? There are racial hierarchies in our society. No one can deny that. I mean, people do, but the, the numbers, the public health statistics, the economic statistics, they are not on your side if you say that. There's a gender hierarchy in our society, right? We know who has the most power and who has the least. We, there's an ability hierarchy in our society. There is a religious, so, so there are all sorts of hierarchies, right? And they work to keep us apart. And there have been people who have put a lot of effort into creating those, making differences, which we should celebrate into barriers. And so when they become barriers, it's really hard for us to break through. You know, there's no reason that our differences should keep us apart. There's really no reason, but the socioeconomic stuff makes it so that we don't trust each other because you either took my job, you think you either took my job or you're gonna steal a thing or you're gonna, you know, wh whatever it is. And I think we need to just be very upfront that like some of us are benefiting and from the way these systems are put into place. I benefit, you benefit, we all benefit in different ways. And so I benefit more than one person, but I don't benefit as much as someone else. And that's what the hierarchy does. So there's that scene in the book when Jeremy and Andres are in bed and, Andre, and Jeremy starts to tell him about how when his uncle died, he left him this house and then he left him another house and he left him this civil war era gun and these mallards. Mm -hmm. and this is generational wealth that is being passed down. So you don't even have to work hard anymore. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to, you know, be the smartest person in the room. Someone is going to die and leave you a house. And when you sell that house, you're going to get out of a momentary crisis, financial crisis, or it's going to put you over the top and put you in a great place. So you'll have savings for the rest of your life. And that is a big load off, you know, to think about that insurance policy there. And there are entire sections of our of our country that don't have any of that generational wealth because there are debts that have not been paid. And I'm speak, thinking very specifically about reparations for slavery and the land back, all of the indigenous nations who have not been, you know, sort of uh, paid back for what has been taken from them. And some things you can never pay back, but you can start with some money. And so that, that to me is something that we need to acknowledge that if reparations were, were, to, would, were to happen meaningfully, meaningful reparations, we would close these wealth gaps. And then we don't have to worry about how do I get along with someone who doesn't look like me, which stresses people out all the time. When in fact, you don't have to worry because we'll all be, we'll be at a sort of in a more equal place economically and the rest, 
there's power in that. There's, there's underestimated power in that. That's very insightful. Um, one of the things that I, that I noticed just on, on, on like a personal note was, um, there's a point in the book where undress, I, I could be wrong. Cause I've been reading the book very slowly over a few weeks, but I think it's the first or second time he visits Simone, I think where he notices how, um, quiet the, the room is that he's visiting her and, and he, and he, he says something like the idea of, uh, I'm completely paraphrasing and possibly misquoting, but like the idea of expecting people to lower their voices or to be quiet in a public place is like a relic of, I believe it was colonialism. It could have just been, or it's one of those systems that you mentioned. And I read that and I, at first I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And then I asked a, a, a very close friend of mine who comes, who um, is, you know, a person of color that comes from an immigrant family. And I was like, what do you make of this? And he's like, yeah, like that's, that's a thing. And I was like, oh, okay. So it's at least one person here is, is, that's reading the book is learning a lot about these hierarchies and in ways that I, even I didn't even know. And I, I like to think that I put thought into this and, and I, uh, the things you were talking about, but I had no idea, even little things like that. And it's it's crazy how even little things like that can can be a you know endemic of of these hierarchies. It's kind of the, the the number of incidents that we have read about over the years that I've witnessed personally, and it's used, it's weaponized. You know, it's weaponized against communities of color and in particular black people in this country to to take you know to make noise or celebration. Anything is used to be like I feel unsafe. You know, I feel unsafe and it happens all the time. People celebrating in restaurants or on a golf course or you name it. And I was, I'm, you know, I was raised in an immigrant family and I was raised to be seen and not heard. You know, never draw attention to yourself. Be quiet. And I know lots of immigrant families who, who say that to me and not just immigrants of color. Um, people who just get here because there's a sense of like, we're visiting, we have to be very quiet and we have to be respectful. And then I'm sure there's a lot of scholarship that would tell me these are sort of Victorian ideals that have been passed down and used to subjugate the poor, the poorer classes. I don't know that history, but it makes sense to me. And so we have come to equate anything that isn't kind of quiet and, you know, we, that quiet is respectful. And I fall into that all the time, you know, I'm like, oh, it's so loud over here. And I'm like, why do I care about these things? And it's because of the way I was raised and the way society told us that if we draw attention to ourselves, then we're not being good guests or we're going to give people reason to look down on us. And so then we start to fall into these traps and then we start to internalize these ideas of what it means to be a healthy and a good person. And conversely, it's used against people. Hey. Well, I think um, I think the novel does a really good job of touching on on those ideas and and more. Um, unfortunately, I believe we are out of time. Um, did you have anything else, uh, Christine, that you wanted to like leave off on, or should I? You're good. Okay. Um, but yeah, so um, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this. This is very nice. Of course. Um, so we are going to definitely, if, if you, if any customers that are watching this, if not now, then later on, um, the book is available in Queens library. It's available wherever you can get your books and, uh, oh, can you tell I've never had to end 1 of these before? <laughs> Um, no, but thank, thank you so much and best of luck with the National Book uh, Award. You absolutely deserve it. This is a phenomenal work, very insightful, um, a great read and entertaining read. I think um, I think I'll, everyone should be picking up this book because it's it's I really I'm really enjoying it. I am enjoying it. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Christine. And yeah, so th thank you very much and. Uh, Best of luck to you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.